Uh, so everyone, welcome back to uh, the Spotlight on Sophos podcast. Um, welcome to episode five. Um, uh, my name is Alex Beeson, uh, the Sophos business manager here at Arrow, and I'm, I'm joined by the wonderful John Hope, as always, by my side today. Oh, thank you, Alex. Thanks for the intro. Yeah, You're episode, welcome. Episode five already, eh? Well, Indeed. Yeah, that far through the year. Can you believe it? Mm. I, I know we're quite a long way through the year because one of my favourite reports has uh, fairly recently landed, which is the the state of ransomware report. Um, I, I think it's probably a good idea we spend a bit of time talking about that during the during the course of this episode. But before we do that, shall we uh, have a little delve into the world of um, technical updates first of all, and uh, just talk about some of the uh, product innovations and launches that we've got going on. That sounds like a perfect starting point for today. So, yeah, we've we've added some enhancements into the adaptive attack protection. I know we've talked about this feature at length, um, and it's one that keeps changing and keeps evolving. So one of the bits of feedback from the field was notifications when devices went into a protection mode, which makes a lot of sense. Um, we've added in um, alerts inside Sophos Central um, that allow you to find out when devices have gone into this mode of protection. Um, we have, however, very intentionally suppressed that from the device itself. Um, obviously, if you've got a cyber criminal attacking the device and uh, they can see that the device has gone into a state of lockdown, um, it kind of mitigates one of the advantages of, of the technology in the first place, which is really around targeting. Um, so the idea is that if we don't display a visual notification on the device itself, the cyber criminals might continue to try and attack the device and try different tools and techniques um, to uh, continue to penetrate that device or at least continue to try and penetrate that device. Um, so it's only notifications inside Sophos Central for a very deliberate reason. Um, so as well within Sophos Central, we've also added the enhancement so that administrators can um, force enable or force disable uh, adaptive attack protection inside Sophos Central as well. So locking down those tool sets that the cyber criminals are likely to use to attack the device and, and attack the network at large. So if you're seeing alerts somewhere else in the estate or you're seeing suspicious activity, then as an admin, you can actually force the device to go into that lockdown mode now as well. Um, and we've also added in some persistent rules too, which is quite nice. So um, the persistent rules are there um, really to leverage some of this functionality on a regular basis. So those those capabilities have been added in there to give you that additional ability there to uh, to to basically perpetually disable some sorts of uh, suspicious activity. So things like abuse of safe mode, for example, is a really really prime example of that. That capability so you can for example prevent devices from going into safe mode in a malicious fashion and you can actually force protection to be switched on even in safe mode as well so one of the standard cyber crim mo's is to um, force a device to reboot into safe mode knowing that most endpoint protection um, products and services don't actually offer the same level of coverage in safe mode um, so being able to stop a device from going into safe mode in the first place is good. Um, and if the device is in safe mode, then running protection still in that environment is is also a wise choice as well. Mm -hmm. I think we may have covered this off last time, Alex, but just in case as well within Sophos Central, um, we've also got some capabilities there to uh, automatically delete inactive devices. So basically... Yeah device hasn't checked in for a period of time you can you can automatically delete those it helps with things like license counts and also cleans up the admin screen for devices that are no longer in use um however it is worth mentioning that you can disable this feature um particularly for individual groups of products so if you have a use case where you know a device maybe isn't switched on on a regular basis and it's not going to be talking to Sophos on a regular basis, then you can exclude that from auto deletion to make sure it's still present uh, inside the console. And as well, you can also redetermine the level of time at which we deem a device to be inactive. So by default, it's 30 days. But again, depending on the usage profile of the organization, you may want to extend that time frame if, if required or indeed even reduce it if you wish as well. Mm -hmm. Um, in terms of deletion of devices as well, there is um, there is a recycle bin, um, which is great if you're careless like me and accidentally uh, press the wrong button. Then <laughs> you can bring your devices back 
from that recycle bin and uh, get them provisioned and get them back up and running really easily. So that's just a, a nice little protection there if you um, if you make a, a little bit of an admin error there at some point. So in terms of endpoint, that's that's probably the, the key stuff done. Um, next down the line, we've got um, the Sophos Managed Services uh, portfolio. Okay. Uh, I know we talked a bit about managed risk um, before, but um, just mm -hmm. a, a reminder that that is now generally available. Um, so I know Alex, you were quite excited to be uh, seeing that integration there and that uh, partnership with uh, with Tenable. Yep, definitely, hundred percent. I think it's uh, it's a benefit of Arrow that we we hold both vendors. Um, so it's great to have a, a good understanding of of how they both work and how they're working in tandem. And it's a great opportunity to bring a, a more holistic solution to to your customers as well, which is always a, a wonderful thing to be able to do. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we're delighted too. Um, just just to let people know, however, it is it is very early stages for for this uh, service. Mm -hmm. So at the moment, um, there are a couple of limitations. One is that um, in order to consume the managed risk service, um, end users need also to be uh, Sophos MDR customers. It doesn't matter what type of MDR, but they must be uh, they must be MDR customers. And it's also worth mentioning at the moment that the managed risk service is only looking at a client's external attack surface. Mm -hmm. now, those things are going to change um so whilst at the moment the service is actively looking for vulnerabilities that are impacting internet facing assets so stuff that the cyber criminals could get out from the outside world for example um yeah. it's going to change so phase two will include also scanning the uh, the organization's internal network as well so okay. looking at the servers looking at their endpoints and again looking for vulnerabilities that uh, might potentially be leveraged by the cyber criminal and then the phase three of this release is where we can actually decouple it from mdr and then it will be available as a standalone service um so once it becomes completely standalone if you're, if you're using sophos on your endpoint if you're using um sophos as part of your security response with xdr or indeed if you're not even a sophos customer then you can still benefit from the managed risk service once we get to that decoupling phase perfect yeah there are some interesting statistics coming down the line actually from the state of ransomware report just a little later on that talk about just how important it is to keep on top of vulnerabilities um, and yeah. we'll explore those in a little while perfect um so some of the changes as well um there is a new integration available now as well for cisco umbrella okay so while sophos of course we have our own dns service which at the moment is tied to the firewall mm -hmm. um there will also be uh, this capability now to ingest telemetry from cisco's umbrella service as well um, so that applies to both MDR and XDR um, customers. So whether you're managing the security yourself or whether you're um, having that outsourced to the Sophos MDR service, in both cases, uh, Cisco Umbrella is another integration. Um, mm -hmm. This is included as part of the network um, integrations pack. So the same pack that you would be buying if you wanted to integrate a third party firewall, for example. And uh, what it's doing is pulling in data from, from these DNS requests that are going through the umbrella service. And it helps us to detect uh, attacks really early phase. So where our users are maybe sending out um, DNS requests to known command and control locations, known malware sources, known phishing sites. Again, we can detect those things. And of course, that is likely to trigger off an investigation that allows either our MDR team or the customer's own security team as part of XDR to carry that investigation and see what's going on there. So um, whilst, of course, we would love you to move over to the Sophos uh, DNS service, that is just another option that's available as well for people who are already consuming Cisco Umbrella. Perfect. Uh, yeah, staying with security services as well, it's probably worth just talking very briefly about incident response. So uh, yeah, I'm sure many of the, the people listening will know that Sophos, as well as having our proactive cybersecurity services like MDR, we also offer an incident response service as well. So you can you can call us that whether you're a Sophos customer or not, and we can help you um, exit a security incident and event in the, in the best possible state. Um, one of the things that we've had for a little while now is an incident response services retainer, but we've, we've done a, quite a big change around on how that's actually packaged up to, to make it even more attractive to the market. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a minimum fee now um, and um, basically then a, a cost per device, which, uh, which goes up um, in terms of how it's actually charged. So it's a, actually a much more straightforward licensing model from that perspective. Mm -hmm. And also what you actually get for the for the uh, the retainer is actually quite key as well. 
Um, so now we offer up to a 50% reduction if you do actually require a rapid response and incident response engagement during the uh, during the life of your retainer. So mm -hmm. really, really healthy discount. Yeah. Um, and this is available to all customers with the exception of MDR complete customers. And of course, the reason behind that is probably self-evident that if you've got MDR complete, you actually get incident response included as part of that package anyway um so it's um it's there for everybody so if you've got mdr essentials or any any of the lower tier like intercept x or indeed again if you're not even a sophos customer then this is a great way to um potentially limit your um, exposure to expensive incident response uh prices um, for a very small, sort of modest upfront fee, really. Um, one of my colleagues said it's a little bit like um, thinking back to device insurance on something like your mobile handset. You know, for a mm -hmm. relatively low fee, you're able to then reduce the um, the exposure if you do need to have a claim uh, as a result of uh, some sort of incident. So, yeah, it's a nice way to offset some of that risk effectively. Yeah, definitely. I, I think as well, just from, I mean, even from our personal experience, we've had three incident response cases uh, over the last month in themselves so um it, it's it's one of those where it's out there and it's happening and, and people are getting in trouble so um being able to have that um safety net of the incidents response retainer knowing that it's not going to cost an arm and a leg um to try and save yourselves at the last minute um becomes very very compelling because uh yeah like i say we've had three um three incident response cases in the last month uh with sophos so um so yeah yeah get get your customers protected Absolutely. Yeah, that's good. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned about people, uh, people sort of, you know, having incidents because that that probably is quite a nice segue onto the state of ransomware report. Actually. Yes. <laughs> and that's that's something, as I'm sure many of the audience will know, I love to talk about. I think it's a fascinating insight into the world of how end users are experienced in this, uh, this sometimes turbulent and challenging world of, uh, of cybersecurity. So, yes, the state of ransomware report is effectively um, a way of getting the temperature and understanding the, uh, the, the, the state of the cybersecurity landscape that, that's out there. Um, it's something which we very deliberately conduct in an independent uh, fashion. So we actually get a third party organization to uh, conduct this survey on our behalf. Um, and it is a really interesting insight into the world of uh, the end user. So many of the types of organizations that maybe you're you're talking to on a day to day basis um, when you're when you're acting as a, as a SOFOS partner. So this year as part of the vendor agnostic survey, we interviewed 5000 uh, IT leaders. So budget holders, decision makers um, across 14 different countries all across the world. Wow. And uh yeah, many of those from from sort of local territories, actually. So uh, in excess of 300 from the UK, actually. So very mm. uh, statistically significant. Um, these organizations were largely selected at random, um, anywhere between 100 seats and 5,000 employees um, across a really wide range of different verticals. Um, and one of the things that we didn't even ask them is what they're doing about cybersecurity, because, again, the whole point is that this is intended to be a vendor agnostic survey. Mm -hmm. Um, so uh, ransomware, first and foremost, of course, in terms of its prevalence, Alex, would you care to hazard a guess? Do you think um, that ransomware is getting even more common or is it starting to, to die down a bit? What do you what do you think that looks like? I imagine with the, the way the market's moving and AI tools and all this kind of stuff that's now uh, now prevalent in our in our industry, I would imagine it's getting more and more Um okay. I, do you know what, I would have been inclined to agree with you, actually. But um, this year we have seen it is a modest reduction. Oh, wow. But it's a modest reduction in the percentage of likelihood of being hit by ransomware. So in both 2022 and 2023, the likelihood of getting hit by ransomware was 66 percent. Mm -hmm. Now, in the same survey, 59 percent of those 5000 organizations were hit by ransomware. So oh. it, it's still very, very significant. But actually, yes that percentage has gone down a little bit. So that is potentially encouraging um, mm -hmm. from one point of view. But what it does also mean is that actually the, the number of attacks overall um, are, are not really going down, but the cyber criminals are also trying different techniques. So maybe mm -hmm. not so much um, ransomware, but actually sort of direct extortion and, and mm -hmm. um, theft of data. So there is an element of moving the chairs around in terms of the styles of attacks rather than it being an overall reduction in attacks. But yeah. never statistics tell us that um, the uh, the likelihood of being hit by ransomware itself has actually gone down slightly. 
Still pretty high, though, I'd say. <laughs> if you look at something your 60%, you wouldn't necessarily say that was low. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. That's very true. And one of the interesting things as well in terms of likelihood that we've we've seen a shift on is if you look at the, the report from last year, certain sectors were much, much more likely to be hit by ransomware than others. So there was a really big... Um, variance between the likelihood depending on which sector you're in so um yeah there was there was a really interesting split and you could kind of see the cyber criminals kind of really actively targeting particular sectors more than others but mm -hmm. we've actually seen that that the, the the trend has now been that it, it's almost kind of leveled off a little bit yeah and almost all sectors are kind of equally likely to a large extent to be hit mm -hmm. um which is which is quite interesting one of the the things that has actually changed quite a lot is that we've seen um a, a tail off from from local government being being targeted and we believe okay. that will be a response to the fact that um the cyber criminals know that these organizations depending on which geography they're in are either unable or un, 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 unauthorized to uh, to do that from a compliance perspective to actually pay yeah. the cyber criminals off Mm -hmm. um so they tend to have swung away from that particular sector but then if you if you look at the the opposite end of the spectrum actually really interestingly central and federal government is is the most likely sector now to be hit by wow. 68 percent, followed very closely by healthcare and then energy oil gas utilities um and the, there is maybe an element of the fact that some of these attacks are, are slightly politically motivated maybe <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say that's probably where it's uh, pushing itself, isn't it, on those kind of areas? Yeah, it's it's hard to say because because so many of these attacks actually they're demanding ransoms anyway, so it's hard to say yeah. exactly what the motivations are. But obviously, I'm sure we're all acutely aware of the geopolitical climate at the moment, so mm -hmm. that may have something to do with it. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, yeah, not quite so easy to work out how likely you are to become a victim these days, which is uh, which is quite interesting in its own right. Um, if you look at education, for example, as well, there's we've, we've seen that they were um, one of the more popular sectors. Uh, in fact, they were the most popular uh, sectors last year, 79 and 80 percent respectively for higher or lower education. Uh, wow. I've put down to 66 and 63 percent. So um, that's uh, no longer the, the highest uh, targeted sector now. Mm -hmm. um, we've seen a little bit of a rise in healthcare from 60 percent up to 67 percent. Um, and at the bottom end of the spectrum from last year, which was uh, high technology, so IT telecoms technology, um, they were 50 percent likely to be hit last time around and, and enjoyed the easiest ride if there is such a thing. <laughs> and that sector has gone up to 55 percent now. So you, as I say, you can see a bit of a bit of a leveling out, actually. Yeah, just a case of no one's safe, realistically. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And you see the same when you look across the countries, there's there's not really an awful lot that we can tease out from countries that are more or less likely to be targeted. The split is still pretty similar to how it was last year. And mm -hmm. um, one of the other interesting things that we've seen as well is the um, the likelihood of all of your devices actually being encrypted. You know, we we hear these horror stories about the fact that your entire estate has been encrypted and there's uh, mm -hmm. there's trouble wherever you look. But actually, when you <laughs> Look at the statistics, and it's typically 49% of computers that are impacted with a ransomware attack. Okay. Yeah, and but there's a reasonable split around there, but certainly almost none of the attacks actually involved encryption of all of the devices, um, and very few of them also related to a small number of devices. It tends to be in the sort of mid-tier, really, uh, that devices are um, impacted. Okay. Uh, so root causes is an interesting thing as well, actually, and we found that... Um, 32% of the attacks actually related to an exploited vulnerability of some type. So this is where software is unpatched or maybe not mm -hmm. updated properly or another, otherwise some way vulnerable for the cyber criminals launching an attack. And uh, this really speaks volumes about the importance of services like Sophos Managed Risk. Mm -hmm. uh, it is really difficult to keep on top of um, all the different uh, vulnerabilities that are out there. Of course, every bit of software is vying for administration attention to be updated, to be patched and and reconfigured. So the real value, I guess, of a service like Managed Risk is to help an organization understand what their exposure looks like, but also helping them to rationalize and understand um, which are the priorities. So which are the most important things that need to be dealt with first? And that's exactly what Managed Risk is here to do, is to help out um, highlighting the things that need patching, which ones need patching quickly, 
mm-hmm. and um, really reducing an organization's exposure that way. So that is uh, still the most common attack vector. Um, would you care to hazard a guess, Alex, at what might be the second most likely root cause of an attack? Um, I mean, I imagine it's probably something to do with uh, usernames and passwords and things like that. I would take take a guess. Yeah, absolutely. You'd be spot on with that. Actually, compromised credentials. Um, compromised credentials are responsible for twenty nine percent of attacks. Um, and again, this speaks volumes about the real importance of um being able to monitor your telemetry and look at your estate and and rationalize what's going on because. Technology on its own is really going to struggle with differentiating between a legitimate user logging on versus a cyber criminal using that same identity against mm-hmm. the organization. You know, there are some things that you can do from a technology point of view to be able to, to mitigate some of these things, but they almost always have a bit of a gray area. So the ability, for example, to detect things like geographically impossible logins is mm-hmm. is in any of these kind of things yep. and also similarly one of the things that we often look for is a, a session being initiated with one operating system let's say windows for example and then mm-hmm. all of a sudden we see linux in the same session you know that doesn't really add up those those are the sorts of things that really require investigation yeah because obviously compromised credentials it's otherwise very very difficult to be able to detect those things because the user right. appears to be legitimate in every way yeah and even, I mean, we used to tout that MFA would solve all of these problems. <laughs> Whilst it goes a long way, of course, there are some documented uh, approaches that will, will you know, allow you to, to bypass MFA. So, yeah, it is a, really a human problem of, of human threat hunting, really. So, again, this leads quite nicely to conversations around things like our managed detection response service here, looking mm-hmm. at it rationalizing them and taking action where it's appropriate um it also speaks volumes as well about things like user training because obviously mm-hmm. compromised credentials must have been compromised in some way yeah um, and that could have been down to a phishing attack which is um you know where the cyber criminals are actually uh, trying to tease your usernames and passwords and credentials out of you so that mm-hmm. They can reuse those again at some point in the future. So, again, you know, I always say that, uh, you know, users are, are really an extension of the security team. And by by teaching them not to click on links, not to give out their credentials and, you know, not to make mistakes of that ilk, then that will help to prevent attacks of that kind of nature. Definitely. I think that's one of the things that obviously a lot of organizations will, from a degree, they'll they'll put as much security as they can in place to uh, to support and stop things like this happening. But ultimately human error is a factor that sometimes you just cannot control so by educating them as much as possible is, is, is your only real only real security at that point from that side of things yeah you're absolutely right and it is interesting as well to see the split so we're going to we're going to keep on the theme of talking about exploited vulnerabilities and compromised mm-hmm. credentials because the ratios and splits between the two are really interesting so if you look at sectors like education for example then um these uh, are sectors that typically experience a higher level of uh, attacks associated with exposed and uh, exploited vulnerabilities probably because they don't simply have the resources to be able to keep on top of patching mm-hmm. effects um so that makes quite a big difference the other one that's quite interesting you talk about things that you can control and unfortunately sometimes even in the world of cybersecurity, there are there are some things that you cannot control mm-hmm. and so we see a high level of exploited vulnerabilities associated with both energy oil gas utilities and healthcare. okay and uh the reason behind that is that um, in both of those um sectors they are typically relying on maybe legacy it that mm-hmm. Um, cannot be updated, cannot be patched. Um, manufacturers of things like medical devices, for example, then they 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 tend to insist that you don't install protection on uh, devices that are attached to, let's say, an MRI scanner that you mm-hmm. then subsequently can't patch it or change it anyway because you know their medical equipment is geared up to work in a particular way. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it does present some challenges there, and and energy or gas utilities, of course, you know the downtime associated with doing an upgrade is so high that this sector will typically carry on using legacy kit um, Mm -hmm. as long as possible so this is a bit of a conversation starter really around ndr because if you can't get the telemetry from the devices themselves if you can't update and patch the devices themselves then maybe using an upstream network scanner to look for attacks orientated towards these kind of devices will Mm -hmm. dividends and, and allow you to protect um from those types of attacks yeah definitely um, we should probably talk a bit about backups as well, actually. So, of course, Sophos reasonably recently launched our integration with Veeam. And um, mm-hmm. 
the state of ransomware report does actually also really uh, indicate that that is a really sensible direction for us to be heading in. And um, mm -hmm. 94% of ransomware attacks actually involved the cyber criminals actively targeting the backups. Wow. Um, so all the things that we've said about the cyber criminals trying to remove the safety blanket of having a backup there, that absolutely um, shows that this is the case in reality. You know, the cyber criminals mm -hmm. getting on board, trying to delete the backups, trying to lock organizations out of their own backups so that um, they, they have no choice other than to pay the cyber criminals off. And it shows that ransomware is really targeting those backups, really as a precursor before the main attack itself starts. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, 57% of those attempts to compromise a backup were actually successful. So, wow. Yeah, exactly. So getting that telemetry in from the likes of Veeam, telling us that the backup is under attack um, is uh, is really, really important there because it shows us the organization is about to become a victim. Um, of course, Veeam is the first and just a, just a couple of uh, extra integrations that will be launched in the, in the not too distant future as well. So if Veeam isn't your backup vendor of choice, then mm -hmm. watch this space because other ones will be added onto to our line card very, very soon. Perfect. So we talked about evolving attack vectors as well. And, and one of those, of course, that came to, to highlight last year was the double dip attack. So mm -hmm. both encryption of data and data theft. And that, that has stayed high. Um, so now 32% of attacks actually involve both encryption of data to lock organizations out of their own data, but also stealing the data as well. And we're seeing a move towards attacks that are solely extortion based and not actually involving any level of encryption as well. So whilst it's still a small number, so we now see that 3% of attacks are actually made up of attacks where there's no encryption at all, but the data is simply stolen. And then the unfortunate victim is uh, is held to ransom and threatened that uh, that data will be made publicly available if they don't pay up. So wow. that maybe that explains some of the drop in percentage of ransomware from one perspective, just because of that yeah. different form of an attack vector. Um, and whilst it's great as well to celebrate the fact that uh, the quantity of ransomware and the percentage likelihood of being hit by ransomware has actually dropped. Um, one of the troubling findings from the 2024 report is the fact that we are still seeing an increase in the number of organizations that are paying the ransom. Mm -hmm. um, so that's gone up to 56% now. So that's wow. gone 10% from, from last year, which is obviously 46%. Um, and this is one of the things that probably troubles me the most, because, of course, we, we'll be perpetuating the problem if we keep paying the cyber criminals off and yeah. their ransom demands. It, it just leads to more and more people falling into this particular industry. So one of the things that does really surprise me, actually, is the fact that so many organizations do make those ransom demands, particularly when the median payment now is two million dollars, which is a five time wow. increase from last year. So the ransom demands have actually gone up five times. Wow. Yeah, it's incredible, um, the uh, the level of demands. And we're seeing a massive shift. When you start splitting out the ransom demands um, into into groups, um, it's amazing how much it shifts to the right-hand side there. So we still see ransom demands of, of huge quantities. You know, a million dollars is not unusual, and, and five million or more is, is now not uncommon either. Um, it is interesting to see as well that a lot of organizations are actually choosing to negotiate with the cyber criminals. <laughs> So, so there is a bit of a percentage variance in the uh, likelihood of an organization actually um, paying the full ransom demand versus uh, being able to at least negotiate it down a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, so whilst negotiation is still a little unusual and 94% um, of organizations simply paid the initial demand, the remaining percentage that choose to negotiate actually tend to come off slightly better off from that negotiation. So 44% of those organizations that entered some form of negotiation actually paid less than the original demand. 24% okay. um, ended up paying the same demand anyway. Uh, so nothing ventured, nothing gained, I guess. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, 31% of organizations ended up paying more. So maybe that's <laughs> wow. a slightly cautionary tale there about <laughs> yeah. in, in negotiation. Um, but uh, it does go to show that at least the cyber criminals will enter a dialogue with you, maybe. Potentially, I think it's it's quite an interesting one. Those those stats that you throw there as well, because obviously we we look at the the silver lining that the the number of ransomware attacks has gone down year on year. But I guess if you look at the ransomware values going up and then the number of people paying those values going up, actually the money being paid to those cyber criminals actually over a, probably on a year by year basis, actually they're probably better off year on even though the number of attacks has uh, has gone down because yeah. they're, they're making more money out of their single 
single point attacks. You're absolutely correct in that. Yeah, absolutely. Would certainly statistics would certainly uh, support that hypothesis that they're making more money out of fewer attacks. Mm -hmm. um, just leaving that theme there, it is interesting. The business and professional services sector um, actually tend to come off the best. Uh, okay. Probably, probably because they're they're kind of as an industry, I guess you're kind of attuned to be negotiating constantly. <laughs> uh, but they typically, on average, would pay seventy four percent of the ransom demand. Um, whereas education is at the opposite end. Uh, <laughs> maybe not a sector quite so accustomed to, to hard nosed negotiations. End up twenty two percent of the uh, the ransom. Wow. Ouch. Yeah. So I want to finish up with some positive news. Um, Good. I guess reflecting the fact that ransomware is is becoming a little bit more normalized now and it's not necessarily seen as shameful to be hit by ransomware. It's really mm -hmm. interesting that of these organizations that were hit by ransomware, 97% of them actually now are engaging with law enforcement. Wow. Yeah. So at least we can start to, you know, categorize these attacks and maybe learn things from the attacks, even if the the law enforcement maybe can't always necessarily reach out and, and uh, prosecute the uh, perpetrators, depending on where they're located, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so 61 percent of those reports, they actually the, the law enforcement team actually gave them advice on how to deal with the attack, which is fantastic. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. sixty percent of them actually also helped out to investigate the attack as well, which is great because okay. they're, they're taking it really seriously. Mm -hmm. uh, Forty percent of organisations involved in law enforcement, the law enforcement bodies actually helped them to recover the data as well, which is quite interesting. Wow. Um, so I'm not quite sure how much that involves practical guidance versus hands on. It's just, just mm. uh, you know a little bit vague at that point, but it's interesting to see um, that. Uh, so many organizations have had some form of assistance. Um, so it's great to see those things being reported in and uh, this this sort of culture of shame and hiding away from the fact that organizations have been hit by ransomware seems to be mm -hmm. to be dropping away. So um, that's, that's an, again, another important statistic and, and one that's worth uh, worth knowing more about. Um, I will just finish up on the, the, the subject of the state of ransomware report by just reminding everybody that there are heaps of really, really useful resources available on the Sophos Partner Portal. So mm -hmm. um, you can uh, watch a recording of the uh, the webinar that we've conducted going through the, uh, the, the findings. You can get, obviously, the report itself, which is a great conversation opener for end users. Um, and there's also a whole bunch of PowerPoint decks that you can turn into your own presentations as well, not just going through the whole report, but then also drilling down into individual territories, individual verticals. So there's loads of really good resources there to help drive your conversations with end users and just making them aware of you know what a significant challenge it, it still is, really. So do lean on those resources and utilize those as much as you possibly can. Definitely. I think that's that's one of the things that that probably isn't used enough is there's so much useful resources on the on the partner portal that we yeah, we'd encourage anyone to go on there and uh, and have a look at some of the details just to support you as a partner and in, in obviously taking this message to your end users and and helping that that conversation go further. Brilliant, Alex. Well, listen, I've, I've rambled on loads um, and I'm sure you've got <laughs> heaps of things to be telling us about. So what's going on in the world of Arrow? Yeah, definitely. So um, I think one of the things that we're, we're gearing up towards or we're executing on at the moment is um, is the XG2 XGS promo that's being released uh, by Sophos. Um, obviously, with uh, XG's going end of life um, beginning of next year, um, it's really key to make sure that, that our partners are getting their customers onto the latest and greatest Sophos devices. Um, and there's various promos in place depending on the customer types and requirements that can be taken advantage of. Um, to make sure that we can put forward the best solution for your customer around the uh, the XGS firewall. So I'd encourage anyone who knows that they've got existing XG firewall customers to to reach out to my team um, on the sophos.ecs.uk arrow.com alias and to, to find out more information. Again, as we mentioned earlier, there's there's heaps of information on the asset library as well. If you I think if you literally type in XG to XGS, um, there's lots of battle cards and things like that just to kind of help with any competitive conversations that might be happening. Um, but yeah, I'd encourage encourage anyone who has those types of customers to investigate that in more detail uh, and reach out to ourselves. Obviously, we'll be proactively reaching out to those partners with those types of customers to support you in any way that we can uh, with those conversations. Um, outside of that, looking a bit further forward, um, we're, we're going to be doing a bit of a collaboration webinar from an Arrow perspective with our, our Tenable and Veen teams, um, really to kind of highlight um, some of the great and, and, and new things coming from both Veeam and Tenable, but also really to highlight those two um, collaborations from a Sophos perspective. It's not something that's 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 a lot of vendors are doing within the industry. Um, so it's actually really nice to kind of see some some vendor collaboration going.
going on and utilizing other technologies to support your existing environment. There's no no need for rip and replace and all this kind of stuff. And I think we're seeing a lot of that come through from Sophos anyway, in a lot of the integrations that we see across MDR and NDR and uh, and those kind of the products that are now being released. That it's a case of just adding that security to your environment rather than having to pull everything out and 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 rip out investments you may have made a year ago or two years ago um you can just really bolster that with with the wonderful technology and and information that sophos have uh, available to them um without being necessarily a fully fledged sophos sophos customer as well fantastic alex yeah there's a lot of stuff going on there that's uh, that's fantastic it's also worth mentioning of course that we are midway through the uh, the sophos partner roadshows um mm-hmm. might be a little late depending on when this uh, this hits the streets but mm-hmm. uh, I will remind people just in case that we have our London Partner Roadshow on June the 12th. Mm -hmm. And a little bit more realistically, there's still plenty of time to register for the Manchester leg, which is happening on July the 2nd. So in both cases, of course, reach out to your account manager, Arrow, and I'm sure they'll be uh, delighted to get you registered. And we'd love to see you at those events. Um, Those will be a great opportunity to hear more about some of the things that we've talked about, some of the themes that we've discussed uh, and also hear a bit more about our roadmap and uh, direction moving forward. So we'd love to see as many Sophos partners as we can there. Yeah, we've seen lots of interest around the roadshows and I'd encourage partners to get in contact with us um, so that we can get you signed up for that. Obviously, there is always, as uh, with any event, there's limited spaces. So um, please don't don't be the one to miss out um, because you left it too late. Please reach out to my team and um, they can send you a registration link. They can register they can register for you whatever it might be um yeah just reach out um because yeah lots of great information um nothing to miss out i think chris hoy's at the london event we've got team g practicing at the manchester event so even if soften wasn't sophos wasn't a pull enough you've got uh you've got some uh interesting cycling stuff going on at the same time as well so yeah i'd encourage everyone to to reach out and get signed up as soon as physically possible fantastic brilliant all right well let's uh let's bring this episode to a close then uh, alex as always thank you for having me on much appreciated um to our audience thank you very much indeed for listening and we'll catch you in about a month's time indeed thank you everyone for joining uh thank you john as always and uh, we'll speak to you all soon